Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing today? It's Aunt Nikki of Your Story Hour, and I'm so glad you've joined me today to read the next chapter in our book called Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo, and Still Mo by Sam Campbell. We are up to chapter 18, and it's called A String That Stretches. Duke arrived on the kind of morning we wanted for the occasion, the kind we called a diamond day. The sun was strong and warm as it peered over the pines along the eastern shore. A light breeze blew from the north, breaking the surface of the lake into myriad wavelets, each crowned with a jewel, the gift of a sunbeam. The living world swelled with life. Buds were now expanding into leaves, unfolding into the forest patterns, an infinite variety of colors and shades. Birches and alders were festooned with catkins like silken cords. Maple leaves peeked out on the world in delicate rose hues, even revealing their brilliant autumn shades. Young aspen leaves dressed in lush green quivering in the morning breeze. Oak leaflets proudly displayed their russet brown. The whole north country hummed with the industry of springtime. Overhead hung the last quarter of an old moon, defying the sunlight, as if it were reluctant to lose sight of this lavish display of loveliness. Birds were singing in such chorus it was difficult to separate their songs sufficiently to identify them. Duke was wandering about the cabin grounds while Ginny put the finishing touches on the first breakfast. We caught glimpses of him through the various windows. It was obvious that he wanted to shake hands with all the growing and living things that stood before him. I saw him walk up and pat the white pine where Mo had lived. He stooped to touch a baby fern that was unfurling at his feet. Every step he took was dogged by still Mo and half a dozen chipmunks, and he knelt frequently to feed them and let them run all over him. I saw him literally take a young cedar tree in his arms, bury his head in its foliage, and crumple a few leaves between his fingers to release the pungent odor. At the lakeshore, he stood for some minutes, arms folded, feet spread, and firmly fixed in position, looking as if it would take a tank to move him an inch. His eyes feasted on the beauty of distant shores and plunked the jewelry, plucked the jewelry from the tiny waves. Duke really looked fine. He had lost a little weight, and his hands shook a bit occasionally, but his strength had, improved, had proved superior to his war experience, and he was on the mend. I'm all right, you good people, he had said on his arrival. Don't think you have to baby me. Let's just forget that anything has happened and carry on as we always have. All I want to do is scoop up armloads of this Northwood quiet and eat it down. Now don't worry about me. I'm okay. Yes, he was okay, in every way but one. Within our hearts, Jenny and I felt sad over the expect, um, exception. Somewhere in the trying and tragic moment, months now passed, Duke had lost his natural joy. The light-hearted, carefree humor through which he had spread so much happiness was gone. His appreciation of what is good and beautiful in the world was, if possible, deeper than ever. But the ready laugh and ready wit were somewhere behind a curtain of heaviness. We felt that only part of our soldier had come to visit us. Even in those first hours where the excitement of his return was at its height, his eyes would become distant and his thoughts stray far from the things about him. Jenny could hardly hold back the tears as we faced the realization that the war had blasted away Duke's youth. But it isn't lost, whispered Jenny. It's only asleep, I am sure. We can awaken it while he is here. We simply must. But sometimes I wonder about these human plans. They are so easy to make and often so impossible to execute. Maybe if we are honest, we must admit that we human beings are not so smart after all. There are ways higher than our ways, and perhaps instead of forcing things too much out of our own will, we should clear the way for right unfoldment 
by simple faith in the operation of a perfect power. Wise men through the ages have spoken of this fact, and the man who did the most did the most for the world said, I can of my own self do nothing. Perhaps the truly important things we are helpless except through our prayers and faith. We cannot make the seed grow. We cannot make life live. We are but witness to the great important facts of the universe in which, in which and with which we live. And there is given us the key to harmonizing ourselves with creation's ways. That is humble devotion to the Creator. I am f- afraid I forgot these points in the first hours Duke was with us. I was so anxious to see his old buoyancy that I tried to force it out of him. The story of the way Stilmo had come back to us was told him with embellishments. A year before, Duke would have entered the story with eyes sparkling. He would have added many comments of his own, pictured dirty snout and bushy tail in cartoon style, and let everyone it led everyone in a grand laugh. But now he looked he only smiled. Then came that distant look, and he whispered so softly, I knew it not intent was not intended for my ears. Still mo. Bluey did his tricks, and I pointed out how he pestered our red squirrel. Duke chuckled a little, but I felt he did it only because he thought it pleased me. The story of Salt and Pepper appearing at a neighbor's cabin drew only a smile and a comment. Good old Salt and Pepper. So they are still alive. There was one little stunt I had been saving for Duke's arrival. Stilmo was to be the victim of a teasing trick that may have been a little mean. Yet I believe the squirrel never thought of it that way. It was just another problem for him, and he was accustomed to problems. I tied a peanut on a long rubber band and fastened the other end of the rubber to a root. Stilmo came running up to the peanut, cocky as usual. He had to chase the chipmunks away in order to have all the trouble to himself. Then he grabbed the peanut in his mouth and started away at the dead run. The rubber band stretched and Stilmo ran until the band reached its limit and brought the surprised squirrel tumbling head over heels to the place from which he had started. Stilmo sat up and blinked his eyes. He wasn't sure just what had happened. There lay the peanut, harmless as could be. Surely that thing couldn't toss him for a loop like that. He straightened out his ruffled hair and thinking this might, this must have been all a mistake, he snatched the peanut again and made another run. Again he came head over heels back to his starting point. With a burst of temper he tried it one more time with the same results. This was becoming monotonous as well as ridiculous. He had buried those peanuts by the score and never had one acted that way before. Maybe this was some special kind. Maybe it wasn't dead yet. He began crawling towards it in that comical, cautious way of his, just as he had approached the milk bottle. Giving those little fretful chirps which registered curiosity, concern, anxiety, and temper all at once, he crept up to the innocent peanut an inch at a time. Cautiously, he picked up the peanut and examined it thoroughly. The rubber band resembled the strings he had known in other problems with peanuts. On those occasions when the string was loosened, the peanut was free. Hence, he pulled with his teeth at the part where the rubber had been wrapped around the peanut. It stretched, and so he figured that was loose enough. Slowly now, he began making his way with the peanut. The band tightened, and he felt the pull. He paused, obviously puzzled then went a few steps further. The pull of the rubber band increased. Maybe he hadn't handled that string just right, so he sat up to take the nut in his front paws once more and look at it. But the rubber band promptly snatched it from his grasp and tossed it away from him. Now still Mo was downright mad. Sitting up and folding his front feet to his breast, he turned loose an uncomplimentary chatter, directed at everything he could see and anything he couldn't. After the peanut, he went again, this time backing away with it in his mouth. 
the rubber band stretched it. The rubber band snatched it from him once more. Stilmo literally pounced upon it then. If the thing wanted a fight, it could have one. For a moment, it seemed that he intended to bury it right where he picked it up. Holding it firmly in his mouth and chattering his ill humor, he began digging what was apparently meant to be a grave for that stubborn nut. But suddenly he spied Bluey overhead, watching every move. If he buried the prize there, the wicked old bird would have it in no time. Forgetting his experience of a few moments ago, the irate red squirrel started up a tree with the pesterous peanut in his mouth. The rubber band promptly brought him back to earth in no gentle manner. Now what to do? We're going to look at the picture. There's the red squirrel and the peanut, the rubber band, and there's Bluey. For a moment, Stilmo was either discouraged or frightened. He dashed away at such speed it seemed he may have thought the peanut was chasing him. But now came Bluey's chance. There is nothing finer in a blue jay's life than to snatch food left by a red squirrel. Down swooped the old rascal, and with marvelous quickness and skill he scooped up the troublesome nut and began his flight. The rubber band was no respecter of persons. It promptly snatched the nut from Bluey's beak. Bluey's persistence was not equal to Stilmo's. Once was enough. A peanut with a disposition like that probably wouldn't digest very well anyway, so he decided to have nothing more to do with it. But he wouldn't leave without expressing his opinion. With obvious anger, the bird flew down and lighted on the ground near the nut. He hopped to within about a foot of it and stood there turning his head from side to side as he looked it over. Then he stretched his neck out until he was within a few inches of the ag aggravating thing and gave that blue jay scolding cry, which tells so much so briefly. Away he flew then, disappearing through the trees towards the mainland. By this time, Stilmo had returned. As usual, he had thought out the situation and came to a solution. He took the peanut up in his front feet, in his forefeet, and sat right there while he cracked the shell and ate the kernels. Then he gave the empty shell back to the rubber band and ran away on other business. Duke had watched the whole comedy with apparent interest, but little laughter. The first day had come to a close. Jenny, Duke, and I sat before an active great fire, singing some old-time songs to the accompaniment of a guitar. Then came one of those periods of silence, which there are, which are as much a part of true companionship as conversation. Sometimes I think of this as one of the tests of true friendship. With acquaintances, we must always be saying something, and silence seems to be evidence of indifference or disinterest. But with a friend who has proved real and true, we are not afraid of the wordless moments. Sometimes it is then that the heart speaks plainest. Duke had leaned forward, resting his head on one hand. Jenny was looking meditatively into the fire. I strummed chord sequences on the guitar. It was many minutes before a word was spoken, and then our captain broke the silence. Um... Um, this is grand, he said. His words proceeded by a sigh. This is the medicine I need. How I dreamed of such things in all that, that bewildering confusion. Jenny and I looked towards Duke and smiled our thoughts. This seemed a better way to tell him how grateful we were that within our simple possessions there was something of use and benefit to him. In our rather futile plans for his stay, there was another item that went awry. We had determined we would not talk of war. Others had advised us that the boys did not want to speak of their depressing experiences, but Duke held no such aversion. He began talking easily, as if it gave him a release to share his adventures. For nearly an hour he talked, 
interrupted occasionally by a question from Ginny or me. It was simple. It was simply a recital of facts. There were no heroics. He told anew of the adventure at sea, where their boat was tossed around by the near misses of bombs. We didn't come through on a wing or and a prayer, he said in calm conviction. It was prayer and nothing else. He spoke warmly of the character and fighting qualities of these men, of his men, the way they volunteered for dangerous missions and the way they carried them out. And there was Lieutenant Stilmo. Duke's eyes moistened a little at mention of his name. The tougher military life became, the better the loot looked. He was... Duke paused, bit his lip, and corrected himself. He is such a human guy, he said with emphasis, always facing things honestly, even dispositioned, and always doing more than his share. Then in sporadic sentences came the review of the story of the tragic mission. It was much as we had heard it. It was a tough assignment, and they all knew they would need to help the help of heaven to pull them through. In Duke's words, we could feel the mystery, darkness, and potential trouble on that far-off tropical shore. There were friendly native troops who cooperated. In rich praise, Duke spoke of Lieutenant Stilmo's hero- heroism, his quick decision, and self-sacrifice. Do you know for sure what happened to him? I asked. No, declared Duke. No one was sure of anything right then. We knew we were discovered, and we had to act quickly. I was knocked out, and the men carried me back. They looked for him, but couldn't find a trace. Nothing has been heard since. There was a quiet moment, again for a moment, and then Duke spoke words strengthened by one of his broad smiles. It helps to talk of these things. I can't ignore them and run away from them. Thanks for listening. Bless your heart, Duke, said Jinny. We love to listen if you want to talk. We want everything to be the way you want it. Yes, Duke said, I realize you do, and I have been wanting to ask you. Please don't try so hard to entertain me. I know I have lost something, but if you don't mind, I would just like to work it out. I feel such a yearning to get into these woods and just think and think. That is the way I want it and I would feel hurt if I burdened you at all. That moment our plans were tossed into the fireplace and went up in smoke. Duke Old Top, I said, the whole place is yours. Just use it the way you want to. Boats, canoes, trails, trees, animals, and Ginny and I are yours to command. You outrank us, boy. You have only one restriction here. You simply have to do as you please. My, that's swell said Duke, rubbing his hands together. You see, I've been planning this ever since I knew I was coming back. I dreamed about it on the way. You are so understanding always. I knew you would understand this too. I want to be alone in the woods. You have work to do, and I don't want to draw you away from it. Anyway, I want to be alone until the roar gets out of my head. I have been seeing people by the thousands and thousands, always excited, always under pressure, no chance to think. It has made me feel separated from things that are real. Yes, I have lost something, or maybe just misplaced it. I know where to look to find it, right in myself. But I feel sure the way to search is to be alone, alone where it is quiet. There was a glow of joy within us as we listened to him talk. The victory was half won, in that he recognized what must be done. The primary power of problems is when they rest in darkness and hide from our attention or recognition. When they are faced without fear, the strength to cope with them springs forth from our spirit. Again there was silence for a few minutes. The firelight set shadows to dancing about the cabin walls. The mantel clock seemed to tick with increased volume. I wonder if the clock ticks away always in the same way. It seems to me ours does not, and its quarter-hour chimes likewise seem to vary in musical quality. 
That clock seems to love moments when the mood is rich with thought, beauty, and understanding. During lighter times, it ticks and bongs away unnoticed. But let something be said that savors of spiritual truth or that we are all carried into depth of thought and its ticks and talks stand out as if it were trying to say, you've got something there. Then it chimes, speaks to define, It speaks a definite amen and amen. That was the way the old clock ticked as we sat there meditating on Duke's words. Duke, I had broken the silence. Yes. Have you ever looked up the word alone? Do you know it's um, derivation? Duke shook his head. Well, if you did, you would understand why you feel you want to be alone. It is made up of two little words glued together, all and one. Our natural desire is to be alone, is that we instinctively want to be all one. That is, complete in ourselves. No part of our true selfhood lacking. Among people, we have so many little nips taken out of us, and we are always reaching some way or other to the opinions people hold us. This leads us to feel incomplete, sometimes to be something others other than what we are, at least not the complete one we have been created. Your thought is calling you to be all one, your complete selfhood, which you can see clearest when you are alone and quiet. You are going back in the woods, not to sweep up little pieces of yourself and paste them together, but to get rid of things in your mind, little illustrations that say you have lost some part of your individuality. You need to be, and you are alone, all one. My, said Duke, looking up, for the first time there was just a glint of the old-time twinkle in his eye. Come back again and hear the next chapter. See you guys later.